Well, thank you. Good morning. Again, it's good to be back here. And again, it's always my privilege to serve the church through preaching. And again, my name is Brother Lemuel Domingue. For those who doesn't know me yet or who forgotten my name, but it's okay. My name is uh, really unique because it's a Hebrew name. But anyhow, here let's uh, continue our study on John chapter 1. The last time I was here, we talked about John the Baptist in John chapter 1, how he fulfilled his role as the one who prepared the way of the Lord. And our application is that we, as the church today, has role, unique roles inside the church, the body of Christ. And why and how should we also fulfill those roles as we serve the Lord? But this morning, we're going to look at the verse from, from verse 35 until the end of the chapter. It's really good to see all those kids at front. They, they remind me of my uh, Sunday school days. I remember I was uh, one of the most stubborn child, a kid in the Sunday school, also one of the most quiet. If you're, if you're going to ask my teachers during that time, I don't think it, it ever came to their mind that one day I will be preaching at front of this number of people. But, but yeah, it's really good to see precious children at the front and talking about Jesus. But here this morning, we're going we're gonna to look at and talk about Jesus. John chapter 1 is one of the most important, I would say, one of the most richest chapter in the Bible because it talks about Jesus. It talks about the character of Jesus. It talks about who He is, what He is, and what His purpose is, why He came here, why He was born into the world. But this morning, let's read in verse 35. The Bible says, and you can read it on your own um, books. Again, the next day after John stood, John the Baptist stood, and two of his disciples, which is Andrew and John the Beloved, John the Beloved, which is the disciple or one of the 12 apostles. Again, remember, there are two Johns here in this chapter, John the Baptist and John the Beloved. John the Baptist was the one who prepared the way of the Lord, who was the half-cousin of Jesus. And then John the Beloved is a different person. He is one of the apostles, 12 apostles, and he is John the Revelator, the one who was exiled to the Isle of Patmos and wrote the, the Revelation or the Apocalypse or the last book in our Bibles. Here is John, John the Beloved. And those two disciples was Andrew, the brother of Peter, and John, the beloved, just to make things clear. And then in verse 36, And looking upon Jesus, John the Baptist was looking upon Jesus. As he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, Andrew and John, the beloved, heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? What are you looking for? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? Where do you live? Where are you staying? And then in verse 39, he saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Come and see. I would like to give this uh, sermon the title, The Invitation of Jesus. Come and see. You know, invitation happens all the time. You know, on, on your church signboard out there, you probably have put there, come and join us. Or you probably went to the mall and you've seen this 50% off, come and buy this. There, invitation, invitation happens all the time. Next year, I will be, um, I will be graduating and then I'll, I'll have my wedding. And then I will be inviting my friends. This month, I will be starting to, my friends and I will be starting to make invitations to send it to, to our friends. You know, an invitation happens all the time. But here, the one who was giving the invitation was Jesus. And you know, have, have you noticed this? That when a person, the higher the authority someone have, the, the stronger our urge to 
respond to that invitation. Imagine if the mayor invited you to his office, the mayor of this city. If he has invited you, sent you a letter, come to my office, you probably would think, oh, I need to go, I need to go. And think about the president, whoever he may be, think about him if he invites you, right, in his office to Washington, D.C. You know, the higher the authority someone have, the stronger our urge inside of us to respond to that invitation. And as you see here now, Jesus is the one that has given the invitation to these two disciples, Andrew and John. He told them, come and see. Come and see where I live. Come and see where I dwell. And you have seen here in this chapter also, the one who has given giving the invitation, Jesus, he said, come and see. And as you have seen, he's, he is the creator of, the Logos, if you have read the whole chapter of verse of, of chapter 1 of John chapter 1, you have seen here that He is the Creator, the Logos, the Son of God, the God in the flesh, the one who has authority over all things that were created. He has the highest authority of all. And He's the one that's giving the invitation. Then, the urge within John the Beloved and Andrew inside of them to respond to that invitation should be the strongest. And also our urge to respond to this invitation, you and I, our urge within us to respond to that invitation, come, should be stronger than any other invitation that will come our way. We should say, yes, Lord, I'm coming. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I'm coming. Now, let's take a look at the invitation of Jesus. Number one, come and see. In verse 38 to 39, he said, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Jesus asked these two disciples, two disciples of John the Baptist first before they even became the disciples of Jesus. What are you looking for? What seek ye? What are you trying to find out? What are you trying to gain? That's what he asked, asked them. Then it, as it was mentioned here, it, it, it was mentioned the 10th hour where it was almost the end of the day, which is around 3 or 4 o'clock in our modern time in the afternoon. The Word of God mentions that they stayed with Jesus, abode with Him that day. They stayed with, it, with Him. I believe that the whole time they were with Jesus and they stayed with Him where He lived, where Jesus was living, Jesus told these two disciples that everything John the Baptist preached about Him was true. These two disciples of John, John the Beloved and Andrew, has been hearing Him for a, a significant time talking about Jesus speaking about this someone who is coming who is greater than him the lamb of god and jesus i believe when he stayed with these two boys two men he told them hey everything that john the baptist has been preaching about me is true you know these two disciples that spent time with jesus when they responded to his call to his to his invitation have proven something they have seen something they have proven all again that John the Baptist preached about him was true about Jesus. They have proven that this is really the Lamb of God, that this is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Sent One. They came and seen, they have seen something, and I believe they have seen the greatness of Jesus. They have seen Jesus' glory. They have seen the glory of God through Jesus. You know, what is glory? Glory, as one of, my favorite, one of my favorite theologians says, there are two types of glory, intrinsic and ascribed. Intrinsic, such a deep word, but you don't have to you know, be intellectual to understand it. It, it. it simply means God's glory is all that God is, meaning who God is. God's divine attribute, divine being, divine perfection. And this glory, this intrinsic glory, we can never add to it. 
God is perfect. God is holy, righteous, gracious, merciful, all the attributes of God that gives Him glory, that makes Him glorious. That's intrinsic glory. We can never add to it. Whatever you do, you can never add to that glory. That's the first type of glory. And the second one is ascribed. This is, as by definition, given. Ascribed, given. It is based on revelation. The more we see God, the more we understand God, the more it gives us the urge to glorify God. The more we know God, understand Him, the more it gives us this worship in our lives, in our heart to give glory to God. That's why in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, the elders said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, they are and were created. That is ascribed glory. And the more we are exposed of God's glory and stand in awe before it, the more it causes us to give glory to Him, to worship Him, as the theologian said. You know, also, this is also what Grudem said in his systematic theology. God's revelation of Himself should be accompanied by splendor and brightness. For this glory of God is the visible manifestation of the excellence of God's character. The greatness of God's being, the perfection of all His attributes, is something that we can never fully comprehend. But before, we can only stand in awe and worship. That is God's glory. You know, God's glory can, is, is, cannot be seen by everyone, everyone that lives in the world. I'm sorry, I'm trying to make my uh, tongue, you know, uh, adjust again in English language because I stayed again with my family in Tennessee, and I, I've, I've been speaking too much of my native language, and it's hard to adjust from that to here. But anyhow, you know, in Matthew 13, 13, Jesus said, seeing they do not see. He was talking about the Pharisees. Seeing him, but they do not see. Have we, have we truly seen Jesus? Like the Pharisees, they see Jesus in person, but they do not truly see him. They, 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 they don't see who he truly is. Seeing, they do not see. That's what Jesus said. I'm not talking about, you know, seeing with the eyes of our head, but with the eyes of our heart, spiritual eyes. Are we seeing and yet we do not see? Just like the Pharisees, seeing, they do not see, Jesus said. To illustrate, this is what the theologian said, it is as though a child should look at a Michelangelo painting and prefer a comic strip. You know, that a child here doesn't even know who Michelangelo is. And when he looks at a painting or an art done by Michelangelo, he, he can't appreciate it because he doesn't know the artist, a kid. And seeing we do not see is something like that. We need to see with our spiritual eyes because through these spiritual eyes, we see the truth and beauty and value of Jesus Christ for what He really is. Thus, a blind person today may see Christ more clearly than many who have eyes, and I quote. You know, this is what Jesus did or revealed to these two disciples, Andrew and John, when he invited them, come and see. Yes, in context, he was telling them, come and see where I, where I live. See, see where my dwelling place is. This is my room. This is my table. That's the context. Yes, he told them, come and see where I live. But friends, he also opened their spiritual eyes to see deeper, to see more than this dwelling place where he lives, to see, you know, greater than this dwelling place, to see who Jesus is. He opened their spiritual eyes. And folks, this was the goal of the author of this gospel, the gospel of John. This was his goal. And that is for us to see who Jesus is. In verse 14, the author said, the writer said, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And then he said, and we beheld his glory. We have seen his glory. We were witnesses to his glory. Because here, John, John the Beloved saw Jesus at first hand 
And not only his face, how he looked like, but he saw his character, his glory. That's what he said here. We beheld his glory. We have seen his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Folks, may we see and truly see, not just seeing and do not see. It is hard for us if we do that, just seeing and not really seeing. Well, like some of us can, some of you can look at me right now, but you're not really there, right? You can look at me, but you're not really looking at me. You know what I mean. And that is seeing and they do not see. Folks, let's look at Jesus, see Jesus, and see him for who he truly is. And here, see him as how the apostles saw him. Notice the proof of their belief. John and Andrew's belief. Here, Andrew showed us he believed everything by going and telling his brother about Jesus. In verse 40 to 41, which also brings us to our second point, the Word of God says, And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finded his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Come and see, that is the invitation, but after that, we need to come and follow. Come and follow. We must respond to the invitation, come and see, but we need also to follow. You know, John the Baptist have been, uh, Andrew and John rather has been hearing about Jesus from John the Baptist. And then when John, John the Baptist said to them, hey, behold, this is the Lamb of God. Come and look at him, see him. You know what? If I was in their position, I would have told John the Baptist, well, if, if, this, the man, if this is the man that you've been talking about for how many months now, then how, uh, see you later, John. See you later. I will go to this man and follow him rather than you because you told us that this man is greater than you. This man is the one sent from God. This is the Lamb of God. Then, well, if I was in their position, I would have told them, see you later, John. See you, see you later. I will follow this man. And you know, it is interesting to see how also the Jewish people respond and follow under the authority of a rabbi. A rabbi as, as what the Word of God says, is a master. One of their practices is that a rabbi walks at the front and then the disciples followed him, their disciples. And a rabbi can, all, can, can only be made a rabbi by another rabbi. Meaning if I'm a rabbi, I can make you a rabbi. That's their practice. But you know, Jesus' rabbiship is different. Notice in John 20 verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, this was the resurrection. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni. That's different from a rabbi. Folks, Rabboni means the divine teacher, the divine master. This is a title only intended for God, not just for a simple man. And like these normal rabbis that the Jewish people had, that they follow and listen to them because they are, they are wise and, and knowledgeable. Folks, Jesus being a rabbi is different. He is the highest of all rabbis. He is the divine master. He is the divine teacher. And these disciples responded and followed the divine teacher. They followed not just an ordinary master, but they followed the divine master. But listen, folks, Look at this. The invitation of Jesus extends towards you and I, not only to those two disciples, but also for you and I. We must listen and respond to this invitation, to this call. Come and see. Come and follow. In verse 34 of John chapter 13, the Word of God says, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one to another. Folks, we follow Jesus by obeying his commandments, by imitating what he has done, by trying to be like him, by trying to be like Jesus, the Savior. I remember when I was uh, training to be an aircraft mechanic in the Philippines. My senior mechanic 
and then we were five boys under him, me, and then my other friend to specifically talk about him, his name was Mike. I met Brother Mike. Uh, I remember your name now. And the, my friend Mike was the favorite of the senior mechanic that we had. So five of us, right? And every time we do something in the aircraft, he calls us, hey, where's Mike? Every time we clean an aircraft, hey, Mike, do this. Every time we, you know, do something inside the airplane, he, he calls, hey, Mike, can you do this? Mike was the, the, was the favorite. And every time at the end of the day, we tease Mike, my friends and I tease him, and, and sing to him, I want to be like Mike. You know that jo Michael Jordan uh, commercial, I want to be like Mike, I want to be like Mike. We were always teasing him because, you know, he's the favorite of our senior mechanic. And, you know, this is, I, I said that to make the point that, you know, we say, I want to be like Mike. Look at these lyrics of that song. Sometimes I dream that he is me. You've got to see how I dream to be. I dream I move. I dream I groove like Mike, like Michael Jordan. If I could be like Mike, like Mike. Oh, if I could be like Mike. You know, sometimes you say, I want to be this person. I want to be like this person. But folks, our desire should be, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like my Savior. I want to be like this man who died for me, who was humble enough to be born in the flesh. I want to be like Jesus. That should be our desire. Come and follow, amen? Follow his steps follow the savior not only that come and be changed that the th that's the third one in verse 42 the bible says and he brought him to jesus and when jesus beheld him when he saw peter he said thou art simon the son of jonah thou shalt be called cephas which is by interpretation a stone come and be changed when jesus met peter the first time and they were introducing their names. Hey, my na hello, my name is Peter. My name is Jesus. But Jesus said, well, today you're not going to be called Peter anymore. You shall be called Simon. How, how do you like that? When, when you meet someone the first time, a stranger, and you introduce yourself, hey, my name is Lemuel. And then that stranger tells you, well, today you're not, not going to be called Lemuel anymore. You're going to be called, I don't know, handsome? I don't know. Remember, th think about that, right? I, I would like that, but no. But how do you like that? Someone changing your name. Someone changing what you are called. That's what Jesus did to Peter. Today, you are be called Simon, a a Petra, Cephas. You know, here, Jesus changed Peter's name. But there's more to that. The more Peter stayed with Jesus, the more he spent time with Jesus, the more he was conforming, being transformed into the image of his master. Notice how people were marveled by Peter's boldness when he was preaching in Acts chapter 4. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, remember, Peter was only a fisher, fisherman, and they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Th these people were amazed. How, how can this man do these things? How can this man preach as boldly as this? They knew that he was only a fisherman, an educated fisherman. No education whatsoever. But they were mar marveling. They were amazed. You know why? Because Jesus changed Peter. Because Peter spent time with Jesus, and that made him closer to the image of Christ. And, and in verse 6, verse 5 of 1 Peter chapter 5, this is what Peter said. Peter wrote, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. What does this show? Peter was talking about humility. You know who Peter is. Peter is this 
opinionated person with a strong personality, uh, this uh, impulsive person, and he was like always on the spotlight. He likes that. But folks, now he's talking about humility. And now he knows about humility. And God used him to write a prescription for young men to be humble, to su submit their selves, subject, to be subject under the older people. He's talking about humility. This is what Jesus does. He changes people. Come and be changed. And not only that, Peter also became the, one of the foundations of the early church. You know, Jesus knew Peter, who he was. But let me tell you this. God, Jesus, knows you and I. He knew you. He knows what, who you are. He knows what's going on in your mind. I think of that song, He knew me when, I was, when he was on the cross. When he was on the cross. You know that song? My, my friends and I in the college, I used to sing this song with them in a group. And that lyric says, He knew me, yet he loved me. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind, and he knew me, yet he loved me. You know, Jesus knew you, and yet still, folks, he loved you. Now, come and be changed like Peter. Remember this also that the Word of God says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all, all things are become new. If you're in Christ, then you should be a new creature. You should be changed. And remember this also, the moment you trusted Christ, as what the brother here said to the kids earlier, you need to accept Jesus. You need to trust on Him, believe on Him. And the moment you did that, folks, you were changed internally. You were born again, regenerated. You were now given a new life. But folks, think about this too. One day, one day, these physical bodies who, who have all these imperfections will all be changed. No more sicknesses, no more death, no more illnesses, no more arthritis, no more getting a hard time standing in the morning. We shall all be changed one day physically. Not only that, and for my last point, and just give me a few minutes, in verse 45 to 49, come and be amazed. Come and be amazed. Verse 45, the Word of God says, Now, Philip, find that Nathanael, and said unto him, We've, We have found him, we have found Jesus, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? He was mocking, he was doubting. Philip saith unto him, Come and see. The same invitation, come and see. And then in verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael, excuse me, coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? When did we meet? Where did I see you before? Where, where did we meet? How, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said, and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Come and be amazed. You notice here how Nathanael's tone changed from a doubting, a mocking tone to a worshiping tone. He was asking him, Philip, is there anything good that, that can come out of Nazareth? Because people from Bethsaida think about the people of Nazareth in a low way. Just like when, you know, here in, in the U.S., when you're from the south and someone is from the north, you think different, differently of them. Oh, that guy's from the south or, or the other way around. That's what I noticed. Or from the east and west. Oh, you're from the west? Oh, that's a land of sin you're from the east oh good folks from from the east but anyhow that's they they they, they hold them in low esteem that's why he was mocking uh, what is is there anything that anything good that can come out of nazareth but folks notice how it changed 
When Jesus told, told him that he saw him even before they met, he went from questioning Jesus' legitimacy into declaring his greatness. In verse 49, he said, Thou art the Son of God. He called him Rabbi, Master, and then, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. That's what Nathaniel did. Folks, it's the same with you and I. Jesus knows you just like he knew Peter and Nathaniel. He knows your character. He knows your heart. He knows you better than you know yourself. Trust me. Just like he knew all these disciples. Even before they came to him, he knows everything about us. And you know, this fact should affect us. This should do something in us. This should strike fear in our hearts that someone knows everything about us. I, I can only imagine if you knew everything about me. And if I knew everything about you, or the other way around, that, that should strike fear in your heart. But you know, Jesus knew everything about us. He's omniscient. He knew everything. He knows everything. We are exposed before the living God. And you and I can't hide anything from Him. It is scary. He is all-seeing, and He is all-knowing. Now, knowing that should strike fear in our hearts again. But also, knowing that should not only strike fear in our hearts, and, our, and I'm almost done, but it also should give us comfort and encouragement. Comfort and encouragement that this man knows everything about us. This man, God, Jesus, knows everything about us. You know why? Because if he knows everything about us, then he knows all your struggles. He knows all your weaknesses. He knows all your suffering. He knows what you're going through. And that means He knows how to help you. He knows what you need, and He knows what to give to you. That should give comfort and encouragement within us, that Jesus knows us. John 10, 27, the Word of God says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. That is a vital fact. We need to respond to that invitation of Jesus. Come and see. Come and follow. Come and be changed. And lastly, come and be amazed. And if we do that, respond to the invitation of Jesus, we will see more of Him, and that will give us the urge to give more glory to God. And let's end the chapter by reading the last two verses. The Word of God says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. He was basically, basically telling Andrew, Well, this is just the start. This is just the beginning. You'll see better things than this. You'll be more amazed than this is what I, you have experienced today. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I said unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Folks, if you haven't, if you are here today and, and if you haven't responded to the invitation of Jesus, come, come and see. Come who Jesus is. Come who He is. Come how, see, see how amazing Jesus is. And follow Him and be changed. And then you will be amazed. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again that you are a loving Father. God, thank you that you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, who was smitten, stricken, afflicted, rejected by men, and yet his purpose, your purpose, was accomplished on the cross. That he died for our sins, he was buried for three days. And rose again on the third day. Lord, thank you because he had victory over sin, over death. And God, thank you for giving us the faith to trust in you, to know you more, to love you more, to understand you better, and to follow you, and to apply your words in our life. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your word. Once again, Lord, we thank you. I thank you for this church. May you be with them and dismiss us with your grace, Lord. And we give you all the glory because you alone is worthy of it. Thank you so much. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.